morning. morning. Welcome to St. Paul's. One of these Sunday mornings, you're going to be surprised to hear a bell ringing, but it is not fixed yet. God never promises us that we won't have hardships in our life. In fact, he says the opposite is going to happen, that we are going to experience those hardships in life. He's not going to make everything be nice and happy for us in this world, but he does promise us that as we go through those hardships, as we face the ups and downs of life, we do not face them alone. We face them with him. That'll be the thought that's with our worship service this morning. We begin with our opening hymn. May God bless you in your worship. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near the true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, 
and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for your sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need. And keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Because of the wickedness of the children of Israel and King Ahab, God was going to cause a drought to happen in the land of Israel but he was going to provide for his prophet Elijah. We hear him being provided for that with a widow at Zarephath. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew or rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Leave here. Turn eastward and hide in the Kareth ravine, east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Some time later, the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. The word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called her and asked, could you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? When she was going to get it, he called 
and bring me a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jar of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family, for the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Here ends our reading. We join in singing our psalm for this morning, Psalm 66. Our second lesson for this morning, and also our sermon text for this morning, is found in Paul's letter to Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 10. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what is to be done in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. 
yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Ephrodite the gift you sent me, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to our God. My God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and the Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Happy are they who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with patience. Hallelujah. Please stand for gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for this morning is found in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, beginning with verse 1. As Jesus would send out 72 followers of his to carry that message of the gospel out, he also promised that they would be cared for. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Enter a house first, say, Peace to this house. If someone who promises promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house, and when you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. For when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into the streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me, rejects him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Here ends our gospel lesson. We join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. 
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the light of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear Christian friends, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Or maybe perhaps you're a little more familiar with the words that are found in the 1984 edition of the NIV. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Ever heard those words? My guess is probably at somewhere, maybe in your own homes, you might have that passage there from Philippians. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. And a lot of times that passage is used to really sort of say a simple message that empowered by faith in Jesus Christ, you can accomplish anything that you want to do in your life. It's a great motivational passage, isn't it? So that you can do, play basketball, fantastic. You can play baseball, fantastic. You can set your minds on anything you want to do. The sky is the limit. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. All those words that way? I can tell you, for me, I can have all the faith I want in my Savior Jesus Christ, but I am never going to be able to dunk a basketball through a 10 foot high hoop. It is not going to happen. I, can, I will not be a star quarterback on any professional team. That will never happen. I can try as hard as I want. I can have as much faith in Jesus Christ, and that is not going to happen in my life. I am never going to play baseball on a professional level, and there are lots of things in this life that I have limits, and I can have all the faith I want to, and I can try all the amount I do, and I will never, ever reach that high goal. I guarantee it. But I also guarantee that for those who are athletically inclined, that they also can have all the faith in Jesus Christ, and they will never succeed to the highest level of people playing in those sports. And even if they make it to the professional level in basketball or football or baseball or any other sport, for every team that wins a championship, there are other teams that will not. And I guarantee you that on both sides of those, that con- contest, there are going to be Christians on those teams. And you might even have someone on that losing side that will have tattooed even on their arms, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. It isn't going to happen. I am not going to be able to achieve everything I want in my life because of the faith that I have in Jesus Christ. Then we go to the other side of the argument. The other side of the argument that it doesn't really matter what happens in life because everything is in this grand design from maybe God, but this grand design that things are going to play out in my life And there is no need to worry. I can be perfectly content because everything that happens in my life is part of this grand plan. And so, for example, if I stub my toe on a rock, there is no reason why I should respond, why I should cry out, because my stubbing that toe on that rock It was all part of God's plan, right? Now, it sounds kind of absurd in doing that, but really the other side says that you can hover above all the other challenges and hardships in your life, and you know that you can be content just kind of hovering above these all these things because everything is going to play out in front of you. There is no need to have any emotions that are expressed and all that. And almost sort of saying, get over it. Just grin and bear it. 
two ways that this passage is sometimes used. It is used in the sense that you have no limits, anything you can do in this life for Christ, or everything's going to play out in your life in Christ, and therefore you really have no need to worry. You do not have to be engaged in any emotion that goes on in anything in your life. You can be perfectly content, perfectly happy, and not have any problems in your life. It doesn't quite work that way, does it? The man who wrote these words, the Apostle Paul, he was a very emotional person. If you read his letters, there are times that the Apostle Paul is mad and angry. There are times, as here in Philippians, where he is filled with joy. There are times that he will go through struggles and challenges in life that he has no idea where things are going in his life. He was an emotional person who went through all of these things in his life, and yet he knew the words of this passage was also true. So how do we face all these challenges and difficulties in this life? Paul says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in control. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. How do we do that? How do we go through life with that kind of contentment that Paul is talking about? And this contentment does not come from within us, does it? It's not me. It doesn't come from within me that I can try as hard as I possibly can do. I can achieve anything I set my, hand, my mind to it. It doesn't come from me if I'm simply to sit back and stand and hover above all the hardships in my life and just be content with what's going on and never experience any emotions with it. How do you do this? How do you have this kind of contentment that Paul is talking about here in our life? A couple of hows. First of all, we need to recognize that we're not in control. And despite everything I've said, there are lots of passages in the Bible that do talk about God having a plan in our life and carrying out that plan. There are lots of passages passage in the Bible that speak about God working good for his purposes or keeping evil away from us. But he doesn't say that that means that we are, not, that we are in control of everything that happens in our life, that everything that goes on in our life is all a result of me. We have to trust in God that we often are not in control. And to see that, think about what happens probably almost every day in our life. We get up in the morning, we have a plan, we have a schedule that is laid out before us. We know this is what we're going to do this day and how many times doesn't it happen that as you begin that day, those plans are thrown out the window? That what you planned to do didn't happen the way you wanted it to do. And God turned it around on a dime very quickly. James says, today or tomorrow we go to this city and spend a year there, carry on business, and money. Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow? What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. God has a way of taking control in our life. But it doesn't mean that it's going to come from within me. It says it comes from him. And secondly, he says, we have to be careful in thinking 
The contentment in this world comes from outside circumstances. That's dangerous, isn't it? To think, I can only be content if this happens in my life, whether that is in work, whether that's some vacation that's planned, whether it's some activity that is going on. Our contentment does not come from the circumstances in our life there. Because if it did, what happens when it goes wrong? What happens when the circumstances in life determine whether or not we are content in Christ? Whether we are happy or not? How many times don't we hear that thought expressed? Something happens in your life, you are happy and you are thrilled. When it goes wrong, you're not quite so happy and thrilled, are you, when that happens? Our contentment in this life does not come from the circumstances in our life. Because if it did, that would be changing on a constant basis. Think of Peter. Think of the apostle Peter. He saw Jesus out there in that boat and in that storm, and Jesus says to him, come on, Peter, come on. And for a short while, Peter does the impossible, doesn't he? Keeps his eyes fixed on Jesus, and he walks on water. But what happened when he took his eyes off? The wind and the waves scared him, and he begins to sink. Our contentment does not depend upon the outward circumstances of our life. And thirdly, we are not entitled to have things always go right in our lives, to have ease in everything we do. But somehow we think sometimes that as believers in Christ, everything should go well for us in this world, that we are almost entitled to it. But you and I know, real life sometimes is really messy, isn't it? It gets really messy sometimes in life. And so what happens when life gets messy, when things don't go our way, when we expect that we should have an ease in our life. What happens when all that goes away? And how do you have that? That's what this passage comes in. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That strength does not come from the outward circumstances in our life. Instead, it comes to us through Jesus. Because if it comes from us, you and I, we are flawed. We have this little thing called sin in our life. That we fall, that we are tempted, and we fail. But there's one who hasn't, and that's Jesus. There is someone who has not any flaws ever in his life. And so what do I need to do? I, who am flawed, need to trust in Jesus who isn't. And if you think Jesus isn't for you, then look at the cross. Look what he's done for you. He gave his life for you. And he promises you not that everything is going to go well, not that everything is going to fail or be positive in your life, but he says, I have a relationship with you. Trust me. I promise that as you go through this life, I will walk with you hand in hand, wherever it might lead. And you don't have control on this but I do. And so we trust him. Why would God do this for us? Why would he promise that he's going to be with us always through everything we face? Because 
loves us. And the result, Paul says in her text, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. May God grant that in your life as well. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. morning, we also remember in our prayers the family of Joan Hansen. Um, this past Thursday, she passed away. Um, her funeral service will not be for a little while, yet it'll be in August, August 31st at Southern Wisconsin Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Union Grove. Um, but we remember her family in our prayers. Dear Lord God, you are a God of hope, a God of promise the promise to go with us through all the ups and downs of life, that our contentment does not come from us. Contentment comes from you and the relationship that has been restored through your blood being shed on that cross of Calvary. May that hope strengthen and comfort us in all things. We also ask that you be with the family of Joan as now they mourn her death, but also to give thanks of the faith that she had in her Savior, Jesus Christ. And may that hope be part of all of our lives until that day comes that we will join all those who are in heaven in Christ. Amen. We join in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of his betrayed, took bread. When he gave him thanks, he broke it and gave it and said to the disciples, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. be seated as you follow the direction of the ushers and come forth for the Lord's Supper.
give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated for a closing hymn.
Good morning, once again, welcome, and thank you for being with us this morning. Um, as I mentioned in the bulletin there, that this coming week here, I'll be up at Camp Bird in Krivitz, Wisconsin for a week. Um, get to spend a week with 150 women and girls, the whole week with me. Should be interesting. I, as I said in the bulletin there, I serve on the national board there, so I'm going up there, and I do daily devotions with them up there. One of the thoughts that was kind of fun this week, and I took a little bit of work, I guess, on my part again, is their theme is based on the book of Esther. And so it caused me to look through and dig into the whole entire book of Esther. It's a fascinating book. Might have to do a series here and sermons on it as well as I looked at that book. So um, anyways, I'll be up there this week. I will have some access to my um, email and, and so forth in my cell phone. So if you need something, please you know, give me a call up there or, or try. I don't guarantee that at every spot I will have access to it because sometimes it gets a little iffy up there of whether or not the signal is strong enough to get through. Um, and their Wi-Fi that they have there at the camp is rather, let's just put it this way, slower in the world in moving. So especially when there are other people on it. So, but I will try to answer anything if I can with that. Um, because of that, we're going to be coming, I'm going to be coming back on Saturday. I really don't think I'm going to be able to turn around and go camping the next day to go on vacation next week. So I'll be here for the service next week. On Sunday, but Pastor Gertner, Joel Gertner of Jesus Cares Ministry, he is preaching for me, preaching for us this next weekend. May God bless you.